Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Ostara and Lily's not here and Jamie's probably maybe jumping up soon. She's under the bed. And as always, I'd like to remind you to stay safe and healthy and please be sure to hit like, subscribe, comment below and hit the notification bell. And tonight we will get back to Rudy Rucker's Infinity and the Mind, the Science and Philosophy of the Infinite. As a groundbreaking work, an excursion to a universe of paradox, puzzles, and imagination to the very limits of science and human thoughts. We are still on chapter one. Um, there's a bunch of, uh, well, little subcategories in it, you might call them. Let's see here. Yeah, we got a little ways to go. Not too much longer, though. Anyway, let's, um, we are on page 24. It's still part of, uh, let's see here. Spatial infinities, so, and spatial infinities. I should have finished it yesterday, but oh well. The question we are concerned with here is whether or not space is infinitely large. There seems to be three options. There's some level and for which n-dimensional space is real and infinitely extended. The situation where our three-dimensional space is infinitely large falls under this case. There's some such, some n such, uh, that small letter n, that there's only one n-dimensional space. This space is to be finite and unbounded, and there is to be no reality n plus one dimensional space. The situation where our three-dimensional space is finite and unbounded and the reality of four-dimensional space denied falls under this case. There are, th there are real spaces of every dimension, and each of these spaces is finite and unbounded. In this case, we have an infinite number of universes, dualverses, etc., or we reach a level after which there is only one n-verse for each n. So, is space finite? Infinite? It seems that we can insist that at some dimensional level it is infinite. Adopt the Aristotelian stance that space is finite at some level beyond which nothing lies, or accept the view that there is an infinite sequence of dimensional levels. In this last case, we already have a qualitative infinity in the dimensionality of space, and we may or may not have quantitative infinity in terms, say, of the total volume of all the 3D spaces involved. I probably showed them. I don't think I showed this. Yeah, that's kind of cool. That was, they was talking from the other one with the, with the Earth, how the they used to believe the Earth was held up by turtles. Foolishness, but here we go. Because we know it's round, or at least most people. <laughs> 26. Oh, excuse me, 26. Infinities in the small. In this sub uh, subsection, I will discuss the e existence of the infin infinity in the small as opposed to the infinity 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 in the large, which has just been discussed. Since a point has no length, no finite number of points could ever constitute a line segment which does have length. So it seems evident that every li line segment, or for that matter, every continuous plane segment or region of space, must consist of an infinite number of points. By the same token, any interval of time should consist of an infinite number of instants, and any continuous region of space-time would consist of an infinite number of events, event being the technical term for a space-time location, i.e. point at an instant. It is undeniable that a continuous region of a mathematical space has an infinite number of mathematical points, Right now, however, we are concerned with physical space. We should not be too hasty in assuming that every property of the abstract mathematical space we use to organize our experiences is an actual property of the concrete physical space we live in. But what is the space we live in? If it is not the space of mathematical physics, it is the space of material objects. It is the space of our perceptions in terms of material objects or perceptions. Points do not really exist for any material or perceptual phenomenon in 
is spread over a certain finite region of space-time. So when we look for the infinity in the small and matter, we do not ask whether matter consists of an infinity of unobservable mass points, but rather whether matter is infinitely indis infinitely divisible. The commitment is avoiding the formless made formless mo made it natural for Greek ato atomists such as Democritus to adopt a theory of matter under which the seemingly irregular bodies of the world are in fact collections of in of indivisible perfectly formed atoms. The four kind kinds of atoms are shaped according to Plato like four of the regular polyhedra. There is one other polyhedron, the twelve sided dodecahedron, and this was thought somehow to represent the universe with its twelve signs of the zodiac. For the atomists, it was as if the world were an immense Lego set with four kinds of blocks. The diverse substances of the world, oil, wood, stone, metal, flesh, wine, and so on, were regarded as being mixtures of the four elemental substances, earth, air, fire, and water. Thus gold was regarded by Plato as being a very dense sort of water, and copper was viewed as gold with a small amount of earth mixed in. And here's the, uh, I'll show you this here. Okay, that's the uh, earth, air, or, okay, earth, air, that's just everything. Fire and water. This says figure 20, A through D, from D, Hilbert and H. Cohn Vosen, Geometry and the Imagination. The alchemists and early chemists adopted the similar system. Only the number of elemental substances became vastly enlarged to include all homogeneous substances, such as the various ores, salts, and, and um, essences. The fundamental unit here was the molecule. A new stage in man's acceptance, excuse me, conception of matter came when it was discovered that if an electric current is passed through water, it can be decomposed into hydrogen and oxygen. Eventually, the vast diversity of existing molecules was brought under control by regarding molecules as collections of atoms. Soon, some 90 different types of atoms or chemical elements were known. A new simplification occurred when it was discovered by bombarding a sheet of foil of alpha rays that an atom consists of a positive nucleus surrounded by electrons. Shortly after this, the neutron was discovered and the physical properties of the various atoms were counted for by regarding them as collections of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Over the last century, it has been learned by using particle accelerators that there are actually many types of elementary particles other than the neutron, electron, and proton. The situation in high energy physics today is as follows. A few particles, electrons, <coughs> neutrinos, and muons seem to be absolutely indivisible. These particles are called leptons. All others, pro <coughs> protons, neutrons, Mesons, lambdas, etc. can be broken up into smaller units, which then reassemble to form more particles. Let's see, okay. I think I'm going to make sure I... Okay. Yeah. The historical pattern in the investigation of matter has been the explanation of diverse substances as combinations of a few similar substances. Diversity of form replaces diversity of substance, so it is not su no surprise that it has been proposed that the great variety of divisible particles that exist can be accounted for by assuming that these particles are all built up of quartz. A second element in the historical pattern is that as more powerful tools of investigation are used, it becomes evident that there are more types of new building blocks than had been sus uh, suspected initially. This is the, is the phase that high energy physics is currently moving into. First, there were three kinds of quark, up, down, and strange. Now the charmed quark has been admitted, and there are two new possible quarks, the top quark and the bottom quark. 
it seems likely that the many diverse types of quirk will eventually be accounted for by assuming that each quirk is a combination of a few, let us say darks, and that there are only a very small number of possible kinds of dark. The cycle will then repeat, with more and more different sorts of dark being indirectly observed, the new diversity be, being accounted for by viewing each dark as a collection of a few smaller particles of which there are a limited variety, this limited variety beginning to proliferate, and so on. If this sort of development can indeed continue indefinitely, then we are left with the fact that a stone is a collection of collections of collections of the stone thus consists of an infinite number of particles, no one of which is indivisible. There is finally no matter, only form, for stone is mostly empty space with a few molecules in it. A molecule is a cloud of atoms. An atom is a few electrons circling on the tiny nucleus. What if any seemingly solid bit of matter proves on closer inspection to be a cloud of smaller bits of matter, which are in turn clouds, and so on? Note that the branching matter tree that I begin to draw for the stone has only a finite number of forks or nodes at each level, but that since there are indefinitely many levels, there are, there are in all an infinite number of nodes or component uh, particles. Let me show you that one that they drew. There we go. There are various obje objections to this sort of physical infinity. One is the Aristotelian argument that unless one is actually smashing the stone down to the quirk level, the quirks are only potentially as opposed to actually there. The point would be that the stone may be indefinitely divisible, but since no one will ever carry out infinitely many divisions, there are not really infinite numbers of particles in the stone right now. There is a more practical objection as well. This is that no quirk has ever been observed in isolation. The existence of quirks is deduced only indirectly as a way of explaining the symmetries of structure that occur in tables of the elementary particles. This argument is not very strong, however. For one thing, a great deal of the great number of the things we believe in can be observed only indirectly and more practically if we can continue to increase the number, the energy of our measuring tools. There is no reason to think that quirks cannot be more convincingly detected. A more fundamental sub, uh, <clears throat> objection to the whole idea of particles, subparticles, etc., is that the underlying reality of the world may be field-like rather than particle-like. By splitting particles indefinitely, we arrived at the conclusion that there is only one form and no content. Many physicists prefer to start with this viewpoint. For these physicists, the various features of the, the world are to be explained in terms of the geometry of space-time. To get a feeling for this viewpoint, one should look carefully at the surface of a river or a small brook. There are circular ripples, flow bulges, whirlpools, and eddies, bubbles that form, drops that fly up and fall back, waves that crest into foam. The geometrodynamic worldview regards space-time as a substance, like the surface of a brook. The various fields and particles that seem to exist are explained as features of the flow. This is figure 22. There. Does a space-time of geometric metrodynamics allow an infinity in the small? There's really no answer to this question at present. According to one viewpoint, there should be a sort of graininess to space-time, and the grain, si grain size would represent a sort of indivisible atom. A different viewpoint suggests that space-time should be as infinitely continuous as mathematical space. What if there really is nothing smaller than electrons and quirks? If there is there any hope of an infinite infinity in the small? One can argue that a given electron can have infinitely many locations along a given meter stick. So that our space really does have infinitely many points. It is sometimes asserted that the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics nullifies this argument, but this is not the case. Quantum mechanics puts no upper limit on the precision with 
which can, one can, in principle, determine the position of an electron. It is just that more, preci more precisely the electron's position is known, the less precisely are its speed and direction of motion, no, motion known. Infinite precision is basically a non-physical notion, but any desired finite degrees of precision is, in principle, obtainable. The precision which, with which something can be measured is such a good example of something that is thus a good example of something that is potentially finite, infinite, but never actually infinite. But this still gives us an actual infinity in the world, for if our electron is located somewhere between 0 and 1, then each mem mem uh, member of the following infinite collection is a possible, possible outcome of a possible measurement. And the numbers that he gave right there. Although infinite precision is impossible, an electron can be found to occupy any of the infinitely many points between 0 and 1, whose distance from 0 is a terminating decimal. There are, however, some modern physical speculations that regard space and time as being abstractions which apply to our size level, but which become utterly meaningless uh, out past the 30th decimal place. What would be there instead? Our old friend, the Aperon? But even if we cannot really speak of infinite, infinitely many space locations, we might hope to find infinitely many sorts of particles. It is sometimes, <coughs> sometimes thought that quantum mechanics proves that there is a smallest size of particle that could exist. This is not true. Quantum mechanics insists only that in order to see very small particles, we must use very energetic processes to look for them. It is illuminating after all this to learn how the high energy physicists actually go about finding new particles. The process is a little too little like finding stations on the radio by inching the dial back and forth till you hear music instead of static. One uses a particle accelerator in which collisions between electrons and positrons are continually taking place. The energy of the collision processes is varied by turning the voltage on the accelerator up and down. That number is R. That measures the particleness of the reaction taking place. R can be thought of as being a little like the information parameter that enables you to tell whether you have found a station, even though the sound of, the mu of music is no long louder than the sound of static. When an energy is found at which the graph of R versus energy has a sudden peak, then it is assumed that the energy in question is characteristic of the rest mass of a new particle. This process is called bump hunting. It is interesting to note that the sharper and narrower the peak, the more long-lived and thus more real the particle is. And I'm going to show you that. Take a little thing. There we go. The question of whether or not matter is infinitely divisible may never be decided, for whenever an allegedly minimal particle is in exhibited, there will be those who claim that if a high enough energy were available, the particle could be de decomposed, and whenever someone's wishes to claim that matter is infinitely divisible, there will be some smallest known particle which cannot be split. One is almost tempted to doubt if the question of the infinite divisibility of matter has any real meaning at all, particularly in view of the fact that each, such concepts as a matter and space have no real meaning in the micro-world quantum mechanics. To return to something a little more concrete, let us consider the divisibility of our perceptual field. There is a limit to the subdivisions that this field can undergo. If two clicks happen close enough together in time, they cannot be distinguished. If a spot of ink is small enough, we can no longer see it. Hume makes much of this fact in his treatise of Human Nature of 1739. Put a small spot of ink upon paper, fix your eye upon that spot, and retire to such a distance that at last you lose sight of it. It is plain that the moment before it vanished, the image or impression was perfectly, invis perfectly indivisible. The best way to understand Hume's view of the world is to regard our space-time as being 
supplemental by an additional dimension of scale. To represent what I have in mind, let us forget about time and drop all the space dimensions but one. If I already showed you that one there. Okay, that was figured for me. Okay, let us forget about time and drop all the space dimensions but one. In figure 24, and this on the next page, I have drawn the space scale continuum for a one dimensional world. An individual's perceptual field has a certain fixed size. As drawn, the field is made up of a certain finite number of slots or uh, tiles. Minimal perceptual units in this model, but the one dimensional creature has two dimensions in which he can move his perceptual field. He can move to the left and right in space, and he can enlarge and contract his perceptual field. Rather than thinking of the field as enlarging and contracting, we think of the field moving up and down on the scale axis, and that's what I'm talking about right there. You want to see that one too? Let's do the left in here. I'll finish reading up to there. Okay. If the labeled objects, mountain, stone, speck of rock dust, occupy the appropriate regions of the space scale continuum, then we can think of the ordinary perceptual level as being when the field is placed somewhere in the middle of the picture. At this perceptual level, stones are visible, but one is neither enlarged one's field of vision enough to see the mountain as a single object. Or, nor contracted one's attention enough to see the specks of dust on the rock. Notice that changing the size of one's perceptual field amounts just so to moving the, thus this field about in the space scale continuum. Hume takes perceptions as a primary, although he is often thought of as an empiricist. His, his is actually an extremely idealistic viewpoint. The perceptions are out there. One's consciousness seems to move along among them like a butterfly flitting them from flower to flower. One's perceptual field is minimal elements, yet these minimal elements can be resolved into smaller elements by altering one's field by paying closer attention, using a telescope, or moving closer to the object in question. The only way to reconcile these two apparently contradictory aspects of our perceptual world is to view the world as a five-dimensional space-time scale continuum. The question of the existence of an infinite infinity in the small now, small now becomes the question of whether or not the space scale continuum drawn in figure 24 extends downward indefinitely, and that's the one I just showed you. Indefinitely. Similarly, the question of the existence of infinity in the large is the question of whether or not a the continuum extends upward indefinitely. I have long been interested in the curious trick that eliminates the infinity in the large and the infinity in the small without introducing any absolute perceptual minimum or maximum. This is simply the trick of bending the spa space scale diagram into a tube. By turning the scale axis into a circle, here the universe could consist of my many galaxies which consist of many star systems, which consist of many planets, which consist of many rocks, which consist of many molecules, which consist of many atoms, which consist of many elementary particles, which consist of many quarks and leptons, which consist of many darks, which consist of many universes. The problem with the circular scale model is that uh, if our universe is broken which is 24 he's talking about, is broken down far enough, one gets many u universes, each of which will break down into many more universes. Are all of these universes the same? Perhaps, but but then it would be hard to see how there could be really, there could really be more than one object in the world. Another difficulty is that if there are many u universes, each of us would, which break up into many more universes. How can each of the component universes be one of the start of, uh, starting universes? There's a little thing that they got there. There's no problem if we have infinitely many universes. To illustrate this, I have drawn a picture of the simplest case, the case in which each universe is made up of two universes. 
we can see that I splits into 1 and 2, 2 splits into 3, and 4, 3 splits into 5 and 6. And in general, n splits into 2n, and there's a little <laughs> 1 and 2n. We can continue split in any given universe indefinitely, thus obtaining an infinite number of components in any bit of matter. What is gained here is freedom from the belief that any size scale is intrinsically more basic or important or complex than any other scale size. Any other size scale. Why waste time on the six o'clock news when you are no more or less important than a galaxy or an atom? The point of this question is that one is often pr pressured to feel that the concerns of society and the world are more significant than one's own immediate person. Let me get back there again. Why waste time on the six o'clock news when you are no more or less important than a galaxy or an atom? I like that. <laughs> point of the que this question is that one is often pressured to feel that the concerns of society or the world are more significant than one's own immediate personal concerns. I like that. But this is based on the assumption that some sizes are in the absolute sense bigger than others. And this and it, is this assumption that circular scale on and it is this assumption that circular scale undermines. Wow. <coughs> Conclusion in this in this one here when that one was the, the conclusion of infinities in the small. In conclusion, note that it is entirely possible that our universe is in every sense finite. A toroidal space time of the sort mentioned in the section on temporal infinities eliminates all infinities in the large, and if circular scale is introduced as in the section or Infinite, on infinities in the small, then there are no discrete infinities in the small. These finitizations can be accomplished smoothly. There need to be need be no end of time, edge of space, or smallest particle. But it is hard to believe that there should would be only one of these t totally finite universes. First, it is difficult to see how to apply circular scale unproblematically unless there are infinitely many universes second. The principle of sufficient reason is violated if only this particular finite universe exists. And third, there is the feeling that the space in which our space-time is curved should be real. In the section on spatial infinities, it was pointed out that if on the other, on the one hand one repeatedly finites ugh, Finitizes by replacing lines with circles, and if on the other hand one never accepts some particular finite end verse as the end of the line, if in other words one thinks along the lines sketched in the last two paragraphs, then one is forced to conclude that space is infinite, dimensional, and there's that there are infinitely many objects in this cosmic space. It's true. I mean, what is the uh, society? When it comes to the universe, it's true. But anyway, I'm going to end it right there. In the next, we'll be getting into infinities in the mindscape. And if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit like, subscribe, comment below, hit the notification bell. And as always, stay safe and healthy. And till next time, from a star and a lily, good night.